The Bible presents many interesting characters, individuals who lived at different points in history. The jailer from the city of Philippi in Acts chapter 16 is one such individual. We're going to look at him today and study about his conversion to Christianity. I invite you to stay tuned. Till the good news was written and the full truth revealed That the church might be whole and Christ's fullness made real Our Lord in His wisdom gave men gifts from above The Spirit then taught them the truth in love And now your host for The Truth in Love, Dave Miller. You are watching the Truth in Love television program. We're pleased that you are watching us, and we hope that you'll take your Bible and commence a study of the Word of God with us. In fact, we're examining today on our program Acts chapter 16, specifically the account of the conversion of a jailer who lived in the city of Philippi during the ancient Roman Empire. Johnny Ramsey is with us today, and Johnny, I think uh, for us to commence our study, I ought to at least uh, read some of these verses of this account of conversion and, and let me just kind of do what I think is usually done in the religious world. Uh, they start in verse uh, 30 and 31 where the Philippian jailer asks in verse 30, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved in thy house. They spoke unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. He took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes and was baptized in all his straight way. And then they brought them into his house, and he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all of his house. Usually it's just verse 31 that I see on billboards or signs uh, when you're driving along, Acts 16, uh, 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, leaving the impression that all one has to do is have some sort of a mental acceptance of Jesus as the Christ and as one Savior, and that that's all that Paul was talking about. Why don't you give us more of a contextual background to this uh, case of conversion? This is an illustration of how a text out of context becomes a pretext. For when we put it in its setting and the entire background context, a new light is shed on the verses you read. When Paul was in Troas, the start of Acts chapter 16, a man in Macedonia appeared to him and said, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Come and do something for us that must be done for us, or we'll perish without it, is the real instance of the Greek word. It's the same word as succor in Hebrews 2.18. The word that, help, help. Yes. Is, okay. In that Christ hath suffered being tempted, is able to mm. succor, come to the aid of, mm. the assistance of those who are suffering. And so immediately he sets forth on a journey that usually took about five days. But this time the Lord providentially speedily blessed him and in less than three days. He'd come to the shores of Philippi uh, a town named after Philip of Macedon, the mm. father, father of Alexander, Alexander the Great. Mm. is a Roman colony. Mm. They counted time midnight to midnight. It wasn't a Jewish area. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he gets there, <clears throat> uh, he meets some women out by the seaside. Lydia from Thyatira, 150 miles away, she and her group of women working for her in the selling of purple, a high-priced business and industry. Uh, there was no Jewish synagogue in this Gentile city, so they were out by the seaside having a prayer meeting. They were going to worship God anyway without a building. Some of my brethren need to learn that. If they go to a place where a congregation doesn't exist, they don't quit the Lord. They start somewhere in a rented hall or mm -hmm. seashore or somewhere in their home. But anyway, Lydia was inclined toward God's will. And so as Paul preached to her, the Bible says the Lord opened her heart. Now, this wasn't magical. He's no respecter of persons. Uh, the entrance of God's Word giveth light. Mm. Psalm 119, verse 130. So this wasn't a Calvinistic, uh, miraculous opening up her heart. It was mm. just like Pharaoh's heart was hardened when the Word of God was preached to him. Mm -hmm. When the sun beats down from heaven, it melts the butter and hardens the clay. Same sun, different results. So, when the word the, of, so it's the demands of the message that actually did the opening right, of her thinking. Because she had an open heart to truth. Mm -hmm. We often say, come with an open heart and an open Bible and study with us. Well, she had that open heart. And as the Word of God was preached to her, notice her response. She was baptized into Christ. Mm -hmm. So believing in Christ involved baptism into Christ. Mm -hmm. That's a prior conversion in the same chapter. Mm -hmm. Certainly the one at the end of the chapter doesn't contradict the one before. And then a young damsel with a spirit of divination, a soothsayer, a fortune teller, one that made a livelihood for her owners, kept following Paul and Silas around saying, These men be servants of the Most High God. Mm -hmm. 
incessantly, she cried. And you know, Jesus wouldn't allow evil spirits to testify of him. And the evil spirits were afraid of him. And so the owners of this young damsel trumped up false charges against Paul and Silas because their means of gain was gone. And they beat them and put them in the most prison. And verse 25 says, And at midnight they prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Mm -hmm. A great earthquake came and opened the prison doors and loosed the bands of the prisoners. And the jailer was awakened <clears throat> by this noise, and he saw the prison doors open, the bands loose, and he just knew the prisoners would escape. And he had a contract, if you will, with the Roman government. If a single prisoner escaped, they'd take his life. Mm -hmm. So he was fearful of his own life, and he knelt down and said, uh, what must I do to be saved? He probably meant saved from physical death. But they gave him an answer more important than that. Sirs, do thyself no harm. Uh, the prisoners are all here, verse 28. And then the, uh, as the jailer bowed before these men that he recognized now as unusual people, they didn't escape when they could. They had an influence over the other prisoners. He now is going to hear the message of salvation from sin. Mm -hmm. Sirs, what must I do? Now that's where your text begins. Mm -hmm. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. But Romans 10 says you can't believe on someone you've never heard. You might want to read Romans 10, beginning with verse 13 here in a moment. And so the next verse says, They spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to those in his house. Why? So they could believe. Mm -hmm. So the believe that, that he's referring to there is not uh, what we think in the sense of uh, uh, a Christian, so-called Christian country. In other words, a place where Christianity has had a lot of... Uh, People have been made aware of it, and so when you say believe on Jesus, people know who you're talking about. This guy was a pagan uh, Gentile who wouldn't have known that. And as you say, Romans 10, uh, 12 and following speaks of there not being any difference between Jew or Greek, uh, but is, is the same Lord over all that call upon Him. Who's, and then he quotes Joel chapter 2, verse 32, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then he says in verse 14, How can you call on Him in whom you've not believed? And how can you believe in him of whom you've not heard? And how can you hear without a preacher? So there are prerequisites to believing, and you've got to hear information. I once uh, visited a beautiful Indian pageant at Wisconsin Dales, Wisconsin. Hmm. Indians from all over North America were there, and they had a pageant out there in a, in a natural amphitheater. They didn't even need microphones. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. But there was a huge religious tent at the edge of this little village. And I walked in there, and in the foyer there was a placard I still have in my files, and it said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Lifted this out of context. Mm -hmm. Let's have a scenario. An Indian who's worshipped the sun, the moon, the stars, and a winding stream walks in there, and they hand him this, and he says, What does that say? The preacher said, uh, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. And he said, Do you believe? And he said, Yes. And he said, You're saved. Then the Indian says, and who is Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. That's the exact setting That's of Acts 16 mm -hmm. because here's a pagan in a pagan land who only knew to imprison after beating these two men because a temporal governmental uproar had been caused. He didn't know anything about them, but he mm -hmm. could tell by their actions and reactions they were strange and different people because they didn't escape. He asked for physical <clears throat> salvation. He's given an answer of spiritual. But the next verse says, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord. Why? You can't believe on him whom you've never heard. So we know for a fact that whenever Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, that the jailer could not then have immediately said, I believe on Jesus and been saved immediately. Cool. Because the very next verse says, They spoke unto him the word of the Lord. And so that, to those in his house. Mm -hmm. See, there are those who say, Now in any household conversions, you've got to have infants and therefore if they were all baptized, there had to be some infant baptism there. Mm. Well, have you ever seen anyone line up babies in a nursery and preach the gospel to them? <laughs> I mean, these people were folk who could ascertain what he was saying right. and respond to it. And it says he and all his straightway were baptized. So it's a reference to extended family, maybe uh, servants and uh, household uh, But there are many, many workers. households in America right now that have teenage children mm -hmm. or young adult children still in the home. There are many homes that don't have an infant in them. Right. And the prerequisites for scriptural baptism demand that it not be an infant because we must believe in order to be baptized, Mark 16, 16. <coughs> Infants don't even know who they are, much less who Christ is. You've got to repent prior to baptism, and that means change of mind. An infant doesn't even know his own mind. Mm -hmm. And you've got to confess the name of Christ, 
But the best they can say is, die, die, or my mom. Mm -hmm. And so the prerequisites for scriptural baptism an infant doesn't qualify for. They can't hear the word of the Lord and think. You have to be able to understand these principles before mm -hmm. you can even accept them correctly. I've had people even beg the issue and say, well, how could he past midnight find water to be baptized in? Uh, it says, those past midnight, he and all his straightway were baptized. Well, I saw a picture that a preacher friend of mine took in ancient <clears throat> Philippi recently. And it had that old jail that's still standing. It's crumbling into the ground. But that same jailhouse of the first century is there. And the back door of that reaches out five yards to the river that Lydia had been baptized in. Mm -hmm. But if the Bible says he was baptized, he and all his straight way, that's what water. happened. There had to have been water. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so somewhere between the jailhouse and his house, evidently <clears throat> he was baptized in probably in that same river Lydia had been mm -hmm. baptized in earlier in this same chapter mm -hmm. in the same city and for the same purpose. But here's a classic illustration of taking a text out of context to mm -hmm. try to prove error. Mm -hmm. This man had to hear the gospel priest, and he did. He had to repent of his sins, and he did. He washed the stripes from the backs of these men. Mm -hmm. And he had to be baptized into Christ, and he was. And that's the same thing they did on Pentecost, the same thing the Ethiopian did, Cornelius did, Saul of Tarsus did. It's the uniform, mm -hmm. one baptism of Ephesians 4, verse 5, that will last to the end of the world, mm -hmm. Matthew 28, 20. Good. I did a, stu a study one time in mm -hmm. verse 34 on the word believing. It said, you know, in other words, after the baptism, af after the um, uh, washing of the stripes, uh, they go into the jailer's house and he sets food out, they rejoice, and then it says, believing in God with all of his house. The term believing there is mm -hmm. uh, a perfect passive. Perfect tense in the Greek New Testament refers to activity that takes place in the past and then the perfect stresses its present standing. It, it is a completed action in the present. So really what that passage is saying is that he was told to believe, he heard the word of the Lord, he was baptized, he repented by washing the stripes. All of these actions had to be accomplished in order for Luke to then write in verse 34, now he's a believer in God. He has completed everything that he needs to do. Now he stands in a completed condition of being a believer. That may be a little bit too technical uh, grammatically, but that's clearly what the past. Well, that's the perfect what Jesus is said, Dave, in John 3, 36. He equates belief with obedience and unbelief with disobedience. Mm -hmm. But the point that's interesting is, just like the Ethiopian only rejoiced after he was baptized in the Christ, it says this man rejoiced after he was baptized in the Christ. Saul of Tarsus was told to arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now notice, wash away sins, call on the name of the Lord, followed baptism. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 16. Peter said on Pentecost, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 38. So every case of conversion in the book of Acts, the book of conversions, how men became Christians, teaches they all had to hear the gospel. They had to believe it. They had to repent of their sins. They were privileged to confess the name of Christ, Acts 8, 37 and then be buried with their Lord in baptism, raised to walk in a new life, Colossians 2, 12, and 13. Mm -hmm. Having put on Christ in baptism, Galatians 3, 27. Now walking in a newness of life after baptism, Romans 6, 1 to 5. Mm -hmm. And the conversion of the jailer, Paul and the Philippian jailer, come out the very same way. The equation never changes, for God is not the author of confusion, uh, 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians 14, 33. And as you say, any time... Uh their mindset or attitude after baptism is indicated. It's not always mentioned, but when it is explicitly stated, uh, it's rejoicing and it always comes after baptism. You mentioned uh, the Ethiopian eunuch who went on his way rejoicing. So anytime we're told what frame of mind they were in before baptism and after baptism, they're always miserable before, you know, like uh, Paul uh, in Acts 9. I mean, he's not eating, he's uh, Fasting and praying for three trembling, days. Trembling, he's fright, frightened, just a right. miserable person. But then when we're told what condition they're in in terms of rejoicing, that's always after baptism. Right. This illustration reminds me of something that happened to me in high school. I got to school one Monday morning and uh, Jane, the girl that had the locker next to mine, said, Johnny, do you have your book report ready for the second period? And I said, what book report? <laughs> she said, that book right down there in the bottom of your locker, and it was about the life of Sam Houston, the transplanted mm -hmm. Tennessean that became leader in Texas. And I had a 300-book 
page book to read in one hour. Fortunately, I had a study hall. That's the only time I ever studied in study hall. I mean, <laughs> I burned the pages off that book, mm -hmm. and I read the introduction, the first chapter, and the last page. That's all I had time for, really. And so I built my book report around Sam Houston, a great leader and yet a very domesticated family man. I got a D on the report because I didn't read the whole book. See, that wife that I was introduced <laughs> to in the first chapter, he later divorced, married again, mm -hmm. had a hectic marital life. Mm -hmm. I didn't read the whole book. I just read a perverted, lifted out of context report. Mm -hmm. Well, people who start with verse 31 of Acts 16 do not represent the context of the whole chapter. They violate the context of the whole book of Acts, and they make up a new plan of salvation the Lord never knew anything about. Mm -hmm. So we've got to get the whole story in context. And the final end is this. He was a pagan in a pagan land. He couldn't believe on one he had never heard of. So they spake on him the word of the Lord so he could believe. And he did believe. And he showed his belief by washing their stripes, which is a change of mind. He had placed them there, his authority had. Now he washed them. That's penitence. Mm -hmm. Then he's baptized, he and all his straightway. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all in his house, so there weren't any infants. Mm -hmm. So when we discuss this, we see it comes out like every other case of conversion. So the believing then, let's, let's reiterate one more time to mm -hmm. make sure that we've gotten this point. The believing then that's mentioned in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, is, a, is an open attempt uh, by Paul to orient the Philippian jailer away from his conception of many gods as a Roman would have believed in, and that, that salvation is to be found in a, in a particular individual, Jesus Christ. So he's, he's pulling him away from his pagan thinking, orient him toward Christ, and then as you say, at that point he preaches unto him the word of the Lord in order to clarify what he means by believe on the Lord. That's not something that's necessarily understood unless you explain what that entails. You mentioned the phrase calling upon the name of the Lord, which also is not to be taken as a literal standing and calling upon Jesus. It's more of a euphemism or an idiomatic way to say, do what the Lord requires of you to do. And that's been different things at different points in history, but certainly in our day, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 13, when he quotes Joel 2 and says, yeah, whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord, he's saying, regardless of your racial background, Jew or Gentile, You've got to do what the Lord tells you to do in order to be acceptable to Him, and then you can become a Christian and, and be saved. Many a televangelist will quote from Joel 2 and Acts 2 and Romans 10 and say, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The statement is true, but their application of it isn't. Mm -hmm. For instance, they say you call upon the Lord when you have a mental assent that you believe He's what He claimed to be. Mm -hmm. But notice, Saul of Tarsus said, Lord, what will you have me to do? Acts 9, 6. The Lord said, you go into the city and there will be told you what you must do Whereas to be he, saved. He should have said, if what they're saying is true, mm -hmm. he should have said, well, you don't have to do anything. You're already saved. Yeah. And then, in the city, three days later, after fasting and praying, if he were saved on the road to Damascus, he's the most miserable saved man the world's ever seen. Three days later, Ananias came to tell him what the Lord said he would tell him that he must do. And notice what he said in order. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord in the Bible fashion shall be saved from past sins. Acts 2.38, Mark 16.16. 16. Because baptism is included in That's that right. process. But baptism and calling on the Lord follow the original belief. I think it's interesting in Mark 1, 12 through 15 repentance precedes belief. And there's a reason for that. They had to repent of believing in idolatry, mm -hmm. in pagan deities. They had to change their mind about who Christ was then they had to believe in Him as the Son of God. Mm. Then they repented of their personal sins and were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Right. Mark 1, verses 1 to 5. Good. So passages in the New Testament that would, that would address more specifically the notion that's in the world today that believing on the Lord means to stand and, and to call upon Him as your Savior, have mental assent, would be passages like uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, um, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. Uh, Lord, didn't we call on thy name, and by thy name cast out demons? He said, I never knew you. And in Luke 6, 46, why parallel. call you me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Mm -hmm. Hebrews 5, 9, Christ is the author of eternal salvation, and all them that obey him. Here is one of the most confusing <clears throat> things that I believe we can enlighten some people on. I've heard people say, the Bible contradicts itself. The book of Acts contradicts itself. In Acts 2, he said, repent and be baptized. Here in Acts 16, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And uh, 
And then Paul, all he told Paul was to rise and be baptized. The answer to that is this. I grew up in the North Texas town of Sherman. It was 60 miles from Dallas. What if at the age of, at the edge of Sherman, heading to Dallas, I asked someone, how far is to Dallas? He said, 60 miles. I go 15 miles up the road to Van Alstein. I say, how far is to Dallas? Same question, but I get a different answer, 45 miles. If he had said 60, it had been inaccurate. He tells you at the station of life you occupy when you ask the question. You go 15 more miles to McKinney and ask the same question. How far is to Dallas? 30 miles. I said, hey, there's a contradiction here. Back in Sherman said 60, Van Austin 45, McKinney 30. But those answers are accurate. If the Bible read like some critics wanted it to, it'd be a contradiction in terms. So here's a man, a heathen in a heathen land. He's got to start at the starting place, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a, a group on Pentecost who already believe. But they've got to repent and be baptized. Here's a man who has believed and has repented, and the man tells him, arise and be baptized. They all have to do the same thing, but they ask the question at a different station in life. Mm -hmm. so God of, is not a contradictor. So each of these were in a different condition, and, and so it is with everyone. I suppose very few human beings, uh, there's so much variety among human beings that we're all at a different stage in our spiritual development, our understanding of the Word of God. And so uh, it makes sense even today for us to uh, say different things to people based upon where they're at in their thinking at that point in time. Apollos, an eloquent man in the Scriptures, had to be taught the Word of the Lord more perfectly. Acts 18. Some people are in that condition. Some are out-and-out -out atheists, infidels. Some are very spiritually minded. They just haven't obeyed the gospel plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Samuel said at an early age, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And from the Hebrew, the original language, that means command and I will obey. Why would anyone argue with any commandment of God? Why wouldn't we want to do everything the Lord asks us to do? Mm -hmm. That's the attitude and frame of mind we ought to have. And so Saul of Tarsus said, Lord, whatever it is you want me to do, tell me. Mm -hmm. And that ought to be our attitude at all times. Another evidence of this uh, variety of how to approach people depending upon how much they know would be uh, Paul, the difference between Paul addressing a Jewish audience where he appeals not only to his own Hebrew background, but goes specifically to Old Testament scriptures versus, say, the Gentile audience of the Athenians, the, the Greek philosophers in Acts chapter 17, where he goes back and tries to reestablish a very fundamental initial principle that there's only one God and all these other gods are false gods. There's another thing we must stress before we leave this, though, and that's the urgency of obedience. Here is a man who now has heard the gospel plan of salvation. It's past midnight. He has a special role in the Roman government as a warden of a prison, and yet it's so urgent to become a Christian, past midnight, he must obey the Lord. We live in an age where people say, well, I'm going to get around to that someday. I may wait till Mother's Day or the revival or some special time. Mm -hmm. This fellow said, it's the salvation of my soul, and I'm going to attend to it now. The same hour of the night. And the Bible says, now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. Harden not your heart. Second Corinthians 6, 2. Uh, Hebrews 3.15, and I really like Psalm 119, verse 60. I made haste and delayed not to obey thy commands. Mm. Uh, Israel waited and all hope was lost, <clears throat> Ezekiel 19.5. The summer is ended, the harvest is past, and we're not saved, Jeremiah 8.20. But now, this moment, is the urgency of obeying Christ. Further proof also uh, that uh, baptism is a prerequisite to salvation, not an after-the-fact thing that you can postpone a week or two weeks mm. or a month. It was something that he recognized needed to be done the same hour of the night. It, it's, it was one of the urgent uh, aspects or factors associated with his conversion. Dave, is it possible that gospel preachers, evangelists, have lost the urgency of the plan of salvation? Have we gotten so caught up in secular things ourselves that we forget the most important thing in all the world is one soul of one lost person? Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark 8, 36 and 37. Have even preachers of the gospel, to say nothing of the average member of the church, have we lost the urgency that this jailer felt and the Ethiopian did? Here's water, what does it me to be baptized? Do we just preach in glaring generalities and act like it's all right if you're saved or lost? Go to heaven or hell? Mm -hmm. If we were more urgent, I believe the people we preach to would be more urgent. I think so. You know, even a lot of our younger preachers are even omitting the plan of salvation from their preaching, ignoring the fact that there are youngsters growing up in that congregation. There are visitors. There are older people who haven't obeyed. And if we would get back to stressing the urgency of the fundamentals of the gospel, these essentials to salvation, 
then perhaps we would see more of an impact uh, than we're seeing Could now. it be that we don't believe lost men are lost anymore? Mm -hmm. That they need the plan of salvation? Could it be that people can come in lost and go out lost and never know the difference in our assemblies? If so, we've ceased being the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Amen. Let's stop right there. Uh, we've, we've examined Acts chapter 16. We hope that you'll study this passage carefully. If you've not rendered obedience to the gospel, all we're asking you to do is exactly what the Philippian jailer do and whatever, uh, did and what every other person in the first century did. When they heard the message of Christ and believed it, they turned from their sins in their mind, that's repentance, and, and in life. And then they confessed the name of Jesus and they were immersed or baptized in water for the remission of their sins. God placed them immediately into the church of Christ and they were saved children of God. That's what we urge you to do. I hope you'll stay tuned. I'll be back in just a moment. I hope you enjoyed the discussion that Johnny and I had today. The title is Paul and the Philippian Jailer, Paul and the Jailer, and we'd be happy to give you an audio cassette tape of our program today, free of charge. All you have to do is write us at the Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas, 76053. That's the Truth in Love, P.O. Box 865, Hearst, Texas, 76053. Request the free audio cassette tape of Paul and the Jailer. We'll be happy to send it to you, no cost or obligation. Thank you for watching today. May God bless you in your study and effort to live for Him. Now the full revelation has been given to man. Let us strive for the kingdom by God's clear plan. We must never be swayed by the doctrines of men. Speak the truth in love and grow up unto Him. Speaking the truth. Speaking the truth. Speaking the truth. Speaking the truth.